reality. And the question is just how do we relate with it? And I think the idea of terror management theory, as we see here on the board, it's our awareness of that and our efforts to cope with the resulting fear that influences many elements of our psyche and our life choices. I may choose to have a different type of diet if I'm afraid of mortality. Someone who's diabetic and is just going to indulge in sweets knows that they're endangering their life, right? So each one of us has the choices we have to make. But I think that we're not here to talk about just the mundane aspects of life and death. We're going to get a little deeper in this discussion. Come on inside. Come make yourself at home. In the corner, just keep us. Well, just to, just to lighten it up a bit, you know, there was once the minister, the rabbi, and the priest, and they were discussing what they want to hear said about them at the funeral. And I got to say, sometimes when I'm at funerals, and they're giving the eulogy, people wonder, like, are they really talking about my husband? Yeah, is that the real? It doesn't sound like him. He was such a kind guy, really? So the rabbi, the minister, and the priest are discussing what they want to be, what they want to hear them say about him in the eulogy. And the priest says, I want them to say what a kind, generous, hospitable, charitable man I was. The minister says, I want them to talk about how knowledgeable and how erudite and how I used to give these lectures. And, and the rabbi says, I want them to say, look, he's moving. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, he's moving is actually very relevant to what we're going to be discussing here because... Does life end with death? Does life begin at birth? So let's explore who we are. What is the Jewish perspective of death is what we're exploring. And to put it short and plain, the Jewish perspective is that death is the end of life as we know it because life just continues in a different way, in a different form. And it's true that we don't get to see the person and interact in the same way, but it's a continuation. In order to understand that best, I think we have to understand who are we. Now I'm sure if I went into Sandton City or even anywhere, forget about it here, because I know the answer already, but if I were to do a little survey to ask are we just all bodies? Are we just flesh and bones? Or are we body and soul? I know the answer already. A hundred percent of you will say that we're body and soul. True or true? True. Let me give you another choice. I'm reminded of the story of the Alter Rebbe. He was the first Rebbe of the Chabad movement. And once he was playing with his young grandson, Mendel, who later became a great Rebbe himself. And they were having a little discussion. And he says, Vui Zayda, where is the Zayda? Where's the grandfather? And his grand, the grandson touches his beard and says, This is Zayda. He says, No, this is Zayda's beard. So then he points to his grandfather's head. He says, This is Zayda. He says, No, this is Zayda's head. So the kid is trying to figure out how is he going to figure out what is Zayda. And he runs around the room. He pretends to be hurt. He shouts, Zayda, Zayda. And the grandfather comes rushing to his rescue, and he says, ah, there is Zayda. Zayda, the person, is not just, we're not just the composite of our, of, of, of a particular part of ourselves. I mean, take a moment, look at your hands. Is that you? Or is that a part of you? Okay. Point to yourself. Now, most people are pointing to where? to their chest, to their heart. Okay, is that you, is the heart you? So what happens if we do a little heart transplant? Okay, it started in this country, and we put someone else's heart into you. Now, are you you or are you the other person? You're still you. A bit of both. Just imagine when they start doing brain transplants. So what's the real you? Your soul. Soul. Well, obviously we're a combination of body and soul. But what is the nature of life? Who are we really? The great Reb Zusha of Anipali. Reb Zusha? Yeah, Reb Zusha of Anipali. He was a great rabbi. I've told many, well, many favorite stories of his. But one in particular is as he was just before he was about to pass on. And he's lying there, in his he's running around his house looking. He says, where is Zusha? Where is Zusha? 
And his friends look at him and say, what do you mean, where's Zusha? You, you see yourself, stand in front of the mirror, you'll see yourself exactly. He says, no, no, no. That's not the real me. Because when I die, you're going to see a lifeless body on the floor. Is that going to be the real me? You're not going to get a response. He says, I'm seeking the real me, the true I. The true I, the true me, I have to realize it's not just the body, but obviously we're a combination of body and soul. And therefore, let's look at our, sec- at our next text, text two. This comes from the mystical works of Kabbalah from Rabbi Chaim Vital. And we'll see how it's articulated in Kabbalah. And I'm open to discussion, to conversation. So anyone who wants to kick in with your perspective or opinion, please feel free to do so. Works. The texts are in there. Okay, text two. Any volunteers for text two? Can we read the text two? It's on page three. It is merely the body of the human being. When we speak of the human being, we are referring to his inner dimension. The body is merely a garment in which the intellectual soul is attired during its sojourn in this world. So, you know, there was a story in Helm, there was a particular Jew, who was always confused who he is. He was never sure, a little bit of an identity crisis. So finally, one day, it was a cave of Rachel, the tomb of Rachel in Israel. You know, they sell those red strings. So he buys one of them. He puts it around his toe. He says, like this, I'll never forget who I am again. But one day, you know, he's at Ein Gedi Spa by Yama Melech, the Dead Sea. And as he's swimming there, that little red string somehow made its way off his foot and put it, went onto someone else's foot. So he turns to the fellow next to him and he says, tell me, I know who you are. But maybe you could tell me who I am. That's why oftentimes I ask for the group discount. They say, where's the group? I say, you don't know how many personalities there are in here. <laughs> so who is this real I? If, based on what we just read from the Kabbalah, who is the real I? Well, Rabbi Chaim Vital put it this way. I am not a particular body part, or even the sum of all my parts. Whether, if, you know, think of someone, God forbid, lost a limb. The limb was severed. Are they not themselves anymore? Did they lose their identity? That's Oscar. <laughs> I, I'm sure I've told you in the past about the shul that was advertising they want a one-handed rabbi. And this guy never lost his arm fighting in the Yom Kippur War, so he applied for the job. They liked him, they hired him. But, you know, he just was curious why they were looking for a one-handed rabbi. You know, no shul's ever advertised that way. So they said, listen, our experience with all the previous rabbis we've hired, well, whenever you ask them a question, they never give you a straight answer. It's always, on the one hand, on the other hand. So he decided, uh, the shul decided we want a one-handed rabbi. Now, with a one-handed rabbi, if his hand is missing, did he lose his identity? No. So the first thing we just read it from Rabbi Chaim Vital is that I'm not just a particular body or even the sum of my parts. And not only that, I'm not, let's take it next. I didn't notice anyone pointing to their brain when I asked you who you are. Everyone pointed to their chest pretty much. But the point is, it's not, I'm not either an accumulation of knowledge. I'm not just my intellect or my emotions or my desires. So who am I? Well, the Kabbalah tells us that we're each a composite of... Actually, it doesn't even say the body. The Kabbalah only said the soul, the neshama. Now, there's five levels of soul. We're not going to get into all the details of it today. Because certain levels of the soul forever remain part of the body. Just to answer a common question that arises, when a person passes on, are the soul and body separated? So what's interesting is we're going to get to that right now in our next, in our next text. What happens? I'll go back to birth for a moment. When we're born, are we a body and a soul? Are we just a body? What happens? How does that? The soul comes into the body. Very good. What about the animals? Okay. 
We're going to discuss this, and it's just interesting. We'll, we'll share perspectives, and I hope you walk away from here today with some information that perhaps you weren't aware of before, some perspectives, at least Jewish perspectives. So just to go back to the question we had a moment ago about the soul and the body, we're going to see this now in the, in the next text, in text 3a. <coughs> Who is the real me? The soul. Now, there are five levels of soul, as I mentioned, and a certain part of the soul called the nephesh stays with the body forever. How would you define the relationship of body to soul? What would you compare it to? What's the body, what's the soul? Because I'm looking around, I see a lot of bodies. It's good to see everybody. <laughs> yeah? When the, the body is the truth or the soul. Okay, so the body is the vehicle. Let's compare it to the iPhone, to the computer for a second. The body is the hardware, and the soul is the software. Okay? Good analogy? Works? Okay. Fair enough. So we're all on the same page here. Yeah? So I believe it is certainly part of us, but that's not the definition of who I am. I cannot be defined, you know, oftentimes you ask people, who are you? Say, I'm a doctor. Is that who you are? You're also a father, you're a mother, you're a friend, you're a good person. There's a lot more to us than just the sum of my parts. So the soul, the neshama, is the essence of who we are. That's our essence. Now what is a soul? That's the next question. And a soul is defined in the Jewish mystical teachings as an actual part of God. God existed from the very beginning of existence, and God forever exists. And therefore, if my soul is a part of God, then just as God is eternal, so are each one of us eternal. Are our bodies eternal? No. The soul is. The soul is not something, if you go into a CAT scan or an MRI, that you're going to find the soul anywhere in the scan. The soul transcends our bodily limitations. So we've so far, we agree that the real me is my soul, right? Page four, we got a question. I asked you already, what is the analogy of the body and soul? So anyone have any other perspectives? As Ram said, the hardware software. Any other ideas on that? Yeah? I want to ask, Sure. what's the, if all your actions are defined by the chemistry of your brain, which they are, right. which defines your emotions and your decisions, Absolutely. what role does the soul actually have in your entire life? So, obviously the brain, that's a fantastic question you're asking, obviously our brain is the functionality of our body, we, we can't do things without the brain dictating. If you open, to open my hands, my brain is dictating that I do so. But all of these aspects of life are living, come on inside guys, there's some more seats around, are limited to my lifetime in a body. And we're going to get to in a moment the importance and the significance of the body's role versus the soul's role. So we'll hopefully address that as we go on. But certainly it plays a tremendous role. Certainly our bodily functions play a huge role. So it's not to be underestimated. How can you prove there's a soul? How could you prove there's a soul? <laughs> Just looking at you. There we see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You said part of the soul remains with... With the body, even when a person passes on. Okay, so what happens if the body disintegrates into lots of pieces? Sure. The body does. And actually, we come, and so we say, the body comes from the dust of the earth, as we're going to read right now on page four. And the body returns to the dust of the earth, and we know that it disintegrates, right? Nonetheless, here's a copy of this lesson. Just to turn to page four. This soul always remains there, and that's why we pray at a gravesite. The reason we, why would we pray at a gravesite if the body is disintegrated and gone? Yeah, but even non Jews have souls. Yes, and absolutely. And some of them get cremated. And that's actually one of the reasons of opposition within Judaism of cremation. Right. But so what happens to the non Jew or the Jew that gets cremated in the molecules and atoms are scattered all over the world? Is there soul over the world? Perhaps one could say that level of their soul, because 
We're going to get into the details over the coming weeks. We're going to talk about reincarnation and all these ideas. And it's a good question you're asking, and I, I'm not giving you a definitive answer because I don't uh, claim to be a authority on this. I have very limited information and knowledge on this topic, but that's what we're discussing here today. What I would say is the reason why, one of the reasons for the opposition of cremation, why Judaism prohibits it, is because, so to say, you're scattering that soul. It's not having a proper resting. It's not getting that proper resting place. It doesn't have that one limited place. Now, nevertheless, a soul is not limited or confined to a body, right? The soul transcends the body. So but there's a certain aspect of the soul that always remains connected to the body. So everything we're eating, all the ground we're treating on is bits and pieces of soul. Well, technically you could say everything in this world is soul, because everything is part of God. But there's something unique about the human soul, the way God created a human being. But in the limit, it means that everywhere you tread, in the bricks, in the walls, yeah. could be pieces of an atom that used to be in a person, that is now, their soul is in the wall, right? Okay, you're talking about the individual. Firstly, to just to say, you speak about you know atoms. Yeah, every, every atom and every neutron and every proton, all those things are aspects of godliness. But we don't see it. Just like you know, you have to look under the microscope to see it. And I would say the same thing pertains to the soul. One has to have that kind of knowledge and information in order to actually go and see it. So I, I don't want to digress too far on that. It's a good question you're asking. I'll try to research it a little better for you for the coming weeks. Maybe next week I could give you a okay, bit better answer. Just point you on a bit, as, as you, when the body is that, where's the limit when the individuality of that soul disintegrates as well? When a person passes on, we say, the soul goes back to heaven. The soul doesn't stay anymore in this world. The soul is in a body while we're alive in this world, right? No, no, no. There are five levels of soul. Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, Chayi, Yechida. And if we go back in the recording, you'll see what I said was a part of the soul forever remains of the body. Which part of the soul is that? The part of soul that's called Nefesh. The Ruach and Neshama, you know, I don't want to go into the, too many details about the different aspects of soul, but just to answer the question. Nefesh forever stays with the body. Ruach, Neshama descends on mine and goes to the heavenly realm. What happens in the other realm? We're going to discuss it. Yeah, but that tiny part that stays that part that stays in the body is yeah. forever with the body. But the body is disintegrated. Right. So the body's so. But that's just as the body disintegrated. That very place. I mean, what happens when you're going to exhume someone who's passed on years ago? The energy of the place. Just the energy. That's why we pray resting places of people because there is a certain spirit energy called the nefesh that's forever present there. But it's a person's body is not unique. I don't know, I can't answer it. I'll, uh, I will plead the fifth and I'll try to research it for you, okay? Yeah? No, I would just. Okay. Any other questions? What's the reason you say Kaddish for you? What can you solve be good or bad if you don't say Kaddish? Very good questions, okay. So, to clarify, I didn't give you, I didn't go through the entire course yet. I'm just going to run through it very quickly. Oops, sorry. Uh, just run quickly through what we're going to discuss each week because we're going to spend time discussing some of your questions in, in coming weeks. For example, why we do Kaddish and all that is going to be in future weeks. So, just to tell you quickly what we have. Today, we're discussing the Jewish perspective on life and beyond. And we have quite a bit to cover, so I'm going to try to get moving on it. Then, next week, we're going to talk about how death informs life. We're going to talk a lot about the golden years how to maximize our time in this world. Lesson three, which I will be absent for, but Batya, who gives a much better class than I do, will take over that class. And that's talking about our evolving relationship with the departed. That's talking a lot about Kaddish, why we say Kaddish. We're saying Kaddish. Kaddish doesn't say anything about the person who passed away. It's about exalting God. But it certainly causes for the elevation of the soul. So we're going to discuss, we'll answer your question in lesson three. That means my wife is going to answer Lesson four is in heaven's name, heaven, hell, and reincarnation. Do we Jews believe in hell? Does it exist? Do we believe in heaven? Gehenna. In your mind? A friend of mine told me that his daughter came home from a date. She really liked the guy. He's handsome. He's good looking. He's got a good job, good money, nice family, all the good things. The only problem is he doesn't, he's an atheist. He doesn't really believe in heaven or hell. 
So he, his wife said, don't worry. Between the two of us, we will teach him as a help. <laughs> and it's fine. He's got the money. Marry him. Lesson five, the morning after. We're going to talk about grief and consolation. Actually, it's something important to know why the customs we have in Judaism. Why there's Kriya on the left side, why there's Kriya on the right side. Who you, how mourning is done. There's so many customs within Judaism. And we're going to discuss the significance, the reasoning behind those customs. And the, the last lesson is the ultimate destination where we're going to discuss resurrection. We're going to talk about reincarnation and things like that. So we'll, we'll get to that. Again, we're going to talk more about Kaddish in the coming weeks. But to answer your question in a nutshell, Kaddish is for the merit of the soul. From a Jewish perspective, it takes 11 months, it, it takes a full year, it can take up to a full year, up to a full year, for the soul to reach that final destination. However, we say only wicked people takes actually a full year, and that's why we do Kaddish only for 11 months, because no one wants to insinuate that a person was wicked. But for someone who really truly was wicked, some people will add that Kaddish for an extra month to say, you know what, let's pray for that person to really get their place. Okay, let's look here at text 3a. And what we're going to do here is look at the Torah's description of the creation of the human being. So we're going to see here the difference. I want you to examine it already now as we go through text 3a and 3b. The difference between... What's that? No. Sorry. The difference between the creation of the human being versus the creation of the animal. Pay attention to the two texts. We need a volunteer for 3A. Who wants to read 3A? Let's go to row two. Anyone for 3A? So, we just read this last week, the Torah portion of Horatio, Genesis, right? It was the sixth day of creation. On the day before that, day five of creation, God created the animal. Who wants to read text 3b, how God fashioned the animal? And then I ask you all the question of what the difference is. So take a look now. Bernice, you want to read 3b? God said, let the earth bring forth living beings of different species, cattle, creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their species. So what's the primary difference between the manner in which the human being was created and the manner in which the animal life was created. You what difference does it make? Pardon? Breathe into us. Breathe into us a, it says, Ayipach ha'ach of Nishman Chayim. Breathe into us a soul of life. What does it say about the animal? Okay, so we're both created from the earth, it seems, right? But by the animal, it was already the body and soul together, one entity. The human being, as Gershom pointed out, it says in the verse, God formed the human from the soil of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the neshama, the soul of life. That means the human being, the body, and the soul, two separate entities. The soul only joined the body after birth, after creation. <coughs> now, the animal is only, you see the focus is on the soil. The human being, it talks about the soul. What is the basic difference between soul and soil? The soil is I. An animal, it looks at the earth, all it cares for is what's there for me, myself, and I. Food for itself, everything for itself. That's the animal. A human being is not supposed to be limited to just what's in it for me. Okay, the other day a gentleman was here at Mencha. He said that there was birthdays in his family recently and he got for one kid an iPad and he got for the other one an iPod and then he got his wife an iron and now he's dead. <laughs> the human being, it should not be soil, I-oriented, but a human being should be soul, S-O-U-L, how we could reach out to another. And in a fascinating teaching in Hayom Yom, it took me some time to work out, but I'm going to share with you this thought, and you tell me how it makes sense to you. It says there that when two people get together, we have two godly souls against one animal soul. What does that mean? 
And he had two animal souls against one, one, two godly souls against one animal soul. So the two of us get together here, and it says, when we get together, it's two godly souls against one animal soul. How's that possible? Why is it not two against two? What's that? Depends which two get together. Which two people get together. <laughs> so this is why I understood it. My animal soul. Again, I don't forget, we talked about five levels of the soul. Every person has a godly soul, animal soul. I don't know if it's two separate entities, or it's one entity, but two separate tendencies. We have animalistic tendencies that are soil, eye-oriented, and we have godly tendencies that are, what can I do for another? So, my animal soul, what is it here for? Me, myself, and I. All it wants is, what can I do for me? It's an animal soul, soil, all about I. So we get together. My animal soul cares for me. Who does your animal soul care for? Yourself. So, one again. Two separate entities. But now our godly souls get involved. Godly souls, S-O-U-L. So his godly soul saying, what could I do for you? And my godly soul saying, what could I do for you? So it's two. The two are getting together against the one that are separate entities that only care for themselves. And that's one of the reasons why it's good to get with, together with others because we can lift each other's spirits, we can encourage one another, we can inspire each other, we can help each other. Yeah? Just two questions. Firstly, the distinction you seem to be making is that humans are less selfish because they consider others. But animals will look after their young because it's all about the propagation of genes. And in fact, human behavior is just an evolution of the propagation of genes. And that our cooperation is just geared towards us being able to further ourselves and our genes, because if I agree to cooperate with you, you will cooperate with me. And so it's still inherently selfish based. And secondly, if you draw this distinction on this of, of the soul being between someone caring about themselves versus, versus caring about others, if you take a, a chimpanzee or a dolphin that's extremely intelligent and capable of complex emotions such as feeling woe when its relatives die, um, and you take an extremely mentally underdeveloped human that doesn't have that same mental capacity, does the human still have a soul about the animal? So there's two questions. Okay, so certainly the whole purpose of creation from a Torah perspective is for the existence of the human being. The animal and everything else in this world all came prepared for us. We came into a ready-made world. Now the Talmud actually makes a very interesting observation about that. There's two ways of perceiving it. On the one hand, you could say, Everything was ready-made for you. You were born, you were created with everything ready-made. Human being, according to the Torah's narrative, came last. Right? So everything came before me in order for me to have a ready-made world. Because the world was created for me. Bishvili nivar olam. There's a saying from our sages, a person should say the world was created for me. And therefore you have an immense responsibility. At the flip side of that is saying, you know that little mosquito, that little annoying mosquito with a little tiny ant preceded you. So don't think you're anything so special. You're, from, you're just but dust and ashes. It's two ways of seeing it. Now, the animal has an animal soul that is inherently selfish. The human being has an animal soul too that's also selfish. The human being, unlike the animal, has the potential to go both ways. To transcend his animalistic tendencies or to remain just animalistic. That's the difference I was trying to convey. That, and yes, you could train an animal, and, and an animal might have certain instincts and other, but an animal's not a human being. Even the human being who might be challenged in certain areas still has the human soul, not an animal soul. And, and that's where you have a very clear distinction between a human being and an animal. As much as one could train an animal to be different, an animal is instinctively an animal. There's a very famous story of Maimonides, Rambam teaches, uh, they, they tell the story that Maimonides once, ha once having a debate with fellow philosophers, and they said, we could change the nature of animals. And so they had this big party where they trained cats to be the waiters. Just imagine cats nicely dressed in tuxedos, white gloves, carrying platters, and they're serving everyone the food. Imagine you come into the party, it's a banquet hall. And the little <coughs> cat offers you, what would you like to drink? What's your cocktail or d'oeuvres? You know what Maimonides did? He opened up a little box that he had in him. And he let out the mouse. And you know what happened next? The cats dropped their platters and went for the mice. 
And that story, I think, perhaps illustrates that as much as we can train an animal, an animal is still an animal. A human being, no matter how limited one might be, we all have that potential. We have that godly soul that God gave uniquely to human beings. And that's what makes a human being unique. And this is the distinction we made here. Very simply was, the, human, the animal was body and soul one entity. Human being, it's two separate entities. The soul exists before the body, continues to exist even after the body is buried. Yeah, but some animals have a natural nurturing instinct. Not, we're not talking about trained animals. Okay, let's, let's not digress. Let's, let's, let's focus on the topic. Let's focus on the topic. We're not going to cover ground. So I, I hear your question. I hear your point. If you have another question, I can answer it quickly. Otherwise... Well, I was just going to ask, at what stage along evolution did we get a soul? Was it when we got ground and like, genetics? Was it when we became like, semi-like? It doesn't say specifically in the verse. It says God fashioned man. I assume he fashioned the human being as a full, as a full human being, maybe, as a fetus is fully developed, and then the soul comes in. According to this perspective, a human being gets the soul as soon as the child is born. Mm. Yeah? That's my question. Why should a child only get a soul when it's born? I mean, it's conceived, it's human, it's mm. growing. Why is that not considered a person with a soul? Because I'm going to look into that. The question is you're asking if during gestation does a fetus not have a soul? Yeah. Good question. I'm going to lean at her. If you want to send me an email afterwards to remind me, and I'm happy to send an email to everyone to, with the answer to your questions. Just that reminds me that there are papers going around the room. Put your name, your information, just write it clearly and easily so I could, after the class, type it all up on my computer and give you, you know, and put it into a database. And what I will do, lean at her, if you want, you can also write your question on the page. So I'll be reminded, or you can send me an email afterwards. And I'll be happy to send an answer to everybody. And the question again asked is, when does the soul enter the body? Is it at gestation or is it at birth? As far as I understand, it's at birth, but we'll, we'll get to that. Okay, I'm happy to look into it. So, just right here, the primary difference between the two, understand, is animal, body, and soul together. Human being, body, then soul inserted. Blue, whatever it says here in the verse, that God breathed into it the soul of life. I'm going to put a spoke in the room. Go ahead. So why is it only at 13 to be say that a little boy uh, becomes responsible? If he's had a soul all the time, a godly soul, yeah. from the very beginning of, of that. He becomes very, a man. Okay, very good question. Becomes a man responsible. I'll, I'll give it to you with my limited understanding. Our soul has both tendencies to be godly and to be animalistic, right? Anyone been to any nice botanical garden lately? Maybe your own garden? And you might have noticed that we have beautiful flowers, you have bed of roses, and you also have weeds. In order for the roses to grow nicely, they require tender loving care. They require maintenance. You have to cut around and water it and care for it. What about the weeds? You have to do anything for the weeds to grow? They just come. They just come. And if you don't take care of it, the weeds are going to overpower, are going to overgrow the beautiful flowers that you're trying to plant in the garden. And perhaps this little analogy can answer our question about the godly soul versus our animal soul. God created us not as angels, but as human beings. And human beings means we have free choice. In order to have free choice, we have to be able to have our... Godly, our spiritual tendencies and our animalistic tendencies is our choice. But in order for the godly spiritual tendencies to come to the fore, they have to be developed, they have to be nurtured, they have to be maintained. And so it takes time. The, re the reeds, the weeds, whatever you want to call them, they just grow. They grow wild. You have to take care of it. And that's why we say bar and bat mitzvah. Women are more mature than men, so at 12... And the man is at 13, that we say then you're responsible. But that doesn't mean your godly soul doesn't have, is not there before. Of course it's there, but it, there's levels of development that takes time for it to mature. Unlike the, the animal soul that's naturally there. So it's possible to have kids and animal soul. No, they have. Everyone has a godly soul, animal soul, it's one soul. But within the soul's development, 
we take by bar mitzvah of this that responsibility because we say it should be a lot more developed by them. And that's, you know, that's the decided age. That's the cutoff. That's it. You've got to be responsible by that. And it's true that throughout one's development, throughout one's maturing, that soul develops more, more and more. Sorry, what do you mean by soul development? Soul development. What I mean for each person, I imagine, might be different. But their study of Torah for a Jewish person, observance of mitzvahs, being a better, kinder person, being less animalistic, self-oriented, doing the things that are more soul, spiritually oriented. But isn't the soul if you came with? If we were perfect, we would have stayed in heaven. God didn't create perfect human beings. God gave us these challenges of life so we could develop ourselves, we could be better people. That's part of the purpose of creation and existence. No, but the soul. Yeah? The soul no, no. I wouldn't say the soul's perfect. Maybe the soul is pristine when it comes to this world. And it's... You could say the true essence, the very essence of the soul is perfect. I'll give you a good example of that, and, and I'm not debating what you're saying. There is, and like I said, there's multiple levels of our soul. By now, I think everybody's confused. <laughs> the, the soul, you want to talk about the essence, the pit of the that's God, that's perfection, right? True, like what you're saying. But don't forget there's the animal part of the soul as well, right? So the spiritual element, I think that comes in growth spurts. That certainly has its development. But who are we? We're a combination of both. We have our godly soul and our animal soul. That's part of who we are. So for example, the ark and the temple. The ark and the temple was comprised of how many boxes? Three boxes. Right? In the Holy of Holies. What were the boxes made of? We had the deepest box inside, which contained within it the tablets, right? It had inside of both the broken tablets and the whole tablets, which I think, again, illustrates the idea that within each of us, we have our broken personality, and we have the area that you met, that you, like you described, it's perfect. It can never be broken. It can never be broken. That's our very essence. But we have both aspects in ourselves. What was that box made of? Gold. Now, that box was inside another box, which was inside another box. Three boxes, right? What was the middle box? Wood. And what was the outer box? Gold. So what's the difference before we get to the point of this illustration? What's the difference between gold and wood? Pardon? The value. And the aesthetics. The aesthetics of it. But you can have the strength. the strength of it. Let's talk about that quickly. The gold is indestructible. As a child, I grew up in a home where my father had a little furnace in the basement, in the garage. And he would go to 47th Street in Manhattan and buy gold dust. And he'd come home. The gold dust is basically when you get your jewelry polished, there's dirt on it, right? So they polish it, and they take off the dirt. But when they're taking off the dirt, some of that gold also comes off. And so he would buy that dust. And then he would come home and refine it, put it into that little furnace. And when you burn it at such a high temperature, the dust burns away, and the gold is indestructible. It's pure, it's pure, exactly. So it comes into a liquid form, and then you let it cool off, and it returns to a solid block of gold. Versus wood. Let's look at wood for a moment. Gold is indestructible, right? Wood. If you pick up your tablecloth, you'll see a nice, beautiful table made out of wood. If you look here, we have a magnificent bima. Thank you, Mike. And a new, and a new iron kodesh on its way, made out of wood, right? Much of this building around you, made out of wood. Looks nice, looks good. Look at the fine detail on the ceiling made out of wood. At the same time, you all know that wood could rot, could decay, could burn in a fire, could easily be destroyed, right? So the difference between gold and wood. Gold is indestructible. Wood has potential to go either way. And I think this is a good analogy for our soul. There's a certain part of our soul, the part that we describe as the part, piece of God, and that part of the soul is called a chelag it's an actual part, it's indestructible. It's a small piece of heaven in everyone's heart. And that's indestructible. That's the deepest box of the ark. 
We call it a Yiddish, a Pintele Yid. Then, there are our emotions. Our emotions, perhaps more related to our animalistic tendencies, sometimes they can be very generous and caring for others, just like we find with animals. It doesn't mean animals are inherently bad. Well, animals can also be kind and generous, as you pointed out. But they can also be vicious and mean. And that's our animalistic tendencies. Our emotions are like the wooden box. The wooden box could go either way. I could wake up on the right side and be in a very generous mood and kind and hospitable and caring for others. Or I could wake up on the left side. Rotten, spoiled, crazy, narcissistic, whatever you want to call me. What is the outside box? Gold. This tells us the Mishnah. We ought to be Despite what our feelings and tendencies are, and we know we have anim animalistic tendencies, it's part of our soul as well, part of our makeup. But who must we ought to be? Our outside, we should try to be a reflection of our deepest inside. I might not be perfect. I might not be perfect. But is my essence perfect like you pointed out? Absolutely. Each of us has a perfect essence. And therefore, we have to try our best to reflect that all the time, to be that personality. Even if I know I'm not really so. Okay. I hope that answered a little bit to that question. Yeah, sorry. Where does the soul reside? Should we do an MRI to check it out where it is? Is it in the blood? I, okay, so it says... You said it's in the heart. No, no, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I said the emotions. But the, the, you mentioned blood. It does say, Adam Huanapesh. The, the, within the Torah, the word Adam wa Nefesh, the soul, the blood is the soul, that tells us that the level of soul, called Nefesh, the part that never parts from the body, that's blood. So I don't think if you did an MRI, you'll actually find the soul, right? But that might be part of it. Is, is there, there's no anatomical location of the soul. The soul is our essence, who we are. Could we see, the soul is our godly part. Could we see God anywhere? No. Our soul is not something that's visible either. Okay. So. So can a soul reunite with another soul? Let's no, say we just did that before. No, no, when you die, I mean, let's say your father, your parents. Yeah. What happens to all those souls? Okay, well, let's discuss that another week. We're going to discuss, we'll get to that topic. What happens to yeah. souls and they connect with other souls? What happens in Ghana? What happens in paradise? All that we're going to get to, okay? <coughs> But the main point we got to here is souls exist independent of the bodies. They're not bound by the bodies. Okay, I'm going to try, to, I'm going to have to paraphrase some of our texts so we can cover as much ground as we can. Okay, so text, uh, text 3C is just the summation of what we just said. That God did for the human being what God didn't do for any of the other existence, any of the other creations. Everything has soul. Everything is part of God. Everything's created by God. But the human being was... What does it say here? He blew into Adam with his holy breath a neshama that is immortal and does not perish when the body does. So, according to this, when an animal dies, it loses its soul. It, 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 the animal die. When a human being dies, there's a continuation. The soul continues to exist. So that being the case, just to sum up the points here. First of all, the soul is not created together with the body. Yes? Number two. It doesn't perish when the body does. Okay. And number three is another point we're going to be getting at now. Where is the soul more at home? In this world or in the spiritual realm? If the soul is of spiritual nature, then the soul seemingly prefers to be in the spiritual realm, which takes us to text 4 and 5, which initially I wanted to do it as a... Let's do it. We're going to give you three minutes. Each person, pair up with the person sitting next to you. Go in groups of two. Read those two texts, and then let's share your thoughts. Text 5, text 4 and 5, page 6 and 7.
Okay, I don't know if you had enough time, but let's look at these two. Anyone want to paraphrase text four for, a minute, for us? Anyone want to paraphrase text four? It seems to indicate that the soul, according to Jewish mystical teachings, the soul is coming from the heavenly realm. Does the soul want to come into this world? No. Just imagine you're on paradise. You're uh, what's paradise for some? You're in Mauritius. You're on holiday. Who wants to go back to Joburg? Who wants to be in the jungle? Yeah? You're comfortable. You're happy where you are. No one wants to leave. I remember as a kid, one summer, I was probably eight or nine years old, and my mother wakes me up. And we were in camp then. It was the summer. We were supposed to go on a trip to Six Flags Great Adventures. That's like a miniature Disney. And instead, my parents say, we're going to this Jewish retreat. I don't want to go to no retreat. I want to go to Six Flags Great Adventures. Okay, I didn't make it to Six Flags. We went on the retreat. And what happens? I'm having a great time. But after two weeks, my parents say, we're going back to Brooklyn, New York. No way! I protest. I don't want to go back. I'm having a great time here. <laughs> Text 4, the Kabbalah is describing the soul. The soul is in the heavenly realm. It's basking in the godly spiritual light. It doesn't want to go into the spiritual realm where we got to deal with annoying co-workers, crazy bosses, mischievous spouses, not mine, but other people's. <laughs> Kids, what's the deal with this stuff? Soul doesn't want to go into this world. The Kabbalah describes, at least metaphorically seeming, that God has to force the soul to actually go into this world. The soul doesn't want to go. It's basking in the heavenly realm of the spiritual light. It doesn't want to go there. I mean, what goes on in heaven? It's a spiritual world. When we talk about the sin, of the spies. Remember, Moses dispatches 12 spies to go scout out the land of Israel before the Jews moved there, before we wound up 40 years wandering in the desert. Remember that story? There's a mystical interpretation of the sin of the spies. Some say, what, what were these spies crazy? They were the leaders of the people. Why didn't they want to go into the Holy Land? That's a land God said is flowing with milk and honey, a blessed land. Why wouldn't they want to go? And so the Hasidic philosophy teaches us something very special. You know why they didn't want to go? Because in the desert, they lived a spiritual life. They were able to study Torah all day and night. They didn't have to worry about material concerns. You go to the land of Israel, you got to worry about terrorists. You got to worry about Jews. You got to harvest the land. You got to work for a, you got to work for a living. In the desert, you didn't have to do that. They ate the manna day and night, spiritual food. They had the protection of the clouds of glory by day, the pillar of fire by night, and they were able to spend their day and their night and all their time doing spiritual things. And so Hasidic tells us that was the sin of the spies. God didn't put us in this world to just be spiritual. That's why there's no l'chaim. <laughs> Not always going to be spiritual. That was the sin of the... That was, that's one interpretation of the sin of the spies. Another interpretation, just while we're talking about them, is I'm always reminded of the rabbi who came to shul and there was a leak. Water's just coming down each week. You know, just... So the rabbi said, I got good news and bad news for you about this leak. He says, the good news is we found the money to fix the hole in the roof. And the bad news is the money's in your pockets. <laughs> All right. So, the difference is, General Montgomery put it this way, the difficult we do immediately and the impossible takes a little longer. Don't ask if you could do something. Rather, the question should be, how can we get it done? You'll see in life, if you can always replace the if with how, you'll have a lot more success in things because it's not a matter of if we could do it. The question is how we're going to get it done. The difficult we do immediately, the impossible just takes a little longer. So that's our text. Text four was about the soul does not want to come into this world. Yeah. Assuming now that the, so the soul has no choice, does the soul not want to develop and learn as much as it can and experience things on earth that will help to develop the soul and spirituality? Well, when I'm in Mauritius, I've never been there, but pretending I was there, and I'm on the beach, and 
this is magnificent, and soaking up the sun, and I can read my books and have no worries about earning a living and all that. Why would I want to go back to Joburg and have to work and, and get involved in all these mishagas? And perhaps, similarly, the soul <coughs> prefers the spiritual realm. Just think about what the spiritual... You're basking in a godly light all the time. You don't have to worry about these mundane things, and that's where the soul doesn't want to go. But it's, as we're going to see in a, in a text coming up soon, it's not the soul's choice. In this world, we have free choice. In that world, there's no free choice. And that's why God coerces the soul to come into this world. It's not your choice. You've got to go. That's why you were created. Not to stay in the heavenly realm, but to come down to earth. Yeah. I just found it odd. <clears throat> if the soul is in its, at its happiest and most right. peaceful in the heavenly realms, and then it comes down, why is then almost universal fear of death? If it knows deep down that it's safe and beautiful up there, why are people so... Uh, why are we afraid of death? Very, very good question. Yeah. That's something you will hopefully go home answered with today. Thanatophobia. Maybe we shouldn't have a fear of death. <coughs> okay, we're going to get to that in a moment. Yeah. Nips. Okay. So that's, that's a deja vu. The Talmud says that when the soul, before the soul comes into this world, the soul is studying, right? You're in the spiritual realm, in the heavenly realm, you're studying, you're engrossed in, you know all the Torah, right? Because you're in the heavenly realm. So before the soul comes into this world, it's nipped right here on above the lip in order to forget what it learned. What's the significance of forgetting what you learned? And what's the point of learning it if you're going to forget it? So maybe, remember, whenever you ever have that deja vu experience? And maybe when we're studying Torah today, it's not the first time you're studying it. You've been exposed to it before. You've studied it. You've learned it. And now, you're just getting a review. So when you study it, it's like, ah, I remember that. Okay. What was text 5? Text 5 comes from a very famous Mishnah. We're going to get back to that Mishnah just now. It comes from Ethics of Our Fathers. What does it say in text 5? Let's read it together. It comes from chapter 4 of Pirkei Avot, page 7. This world, Olam Haza, is compared to an antechamber, a foyer before the world to come. Prepare yourself in the antechamber so that you may enter the palace. So, which is the main place, according to this Mishnah? Is it this world or is it the next world? Mm-hmm. Right, this world is just the waiting room. It's just the foyer. It's just the antechamber. But the grand banquet hall, that's the world to come. That's the main place. So the Mishnah concludes, prepare yourself in this world for the next world. A single moment of bliss in the world to come is greater than all of this world. Okay. So, what is the indication of these Mishnahs? What does it make sense? This is, the, this is the world. This is what God intended us to, to be in. To be, to be here. Not to be in Shabbat. I know, I didn't make up this mission. And, and when the Shabbat comes, the mind is going to disappear. It's going to okay. fall here. So what's the point? He's spoiling the plot, Gersh, and we're going to get to that in the next text. <laughs> Well, uh, one thing for sure, this mission, does it indicate that the world to come is the grand banquet hall and this world is just the preparation for it? No. For now. Yeah. So what it says is the soul in the body is like a stranger on foreign soil. Because according to these two missions that we read, text, fa- text 4, the soul doesn't want to go into this world. The soul is happy in the heavenly realm. Text 5, this world is an antechamber. It's a preparation room for the next world. So the soul is not interested in coming into this world. This world is just a preparation for the next world. The soul is very is much happier if it goes there. And like you asked, then what's the fear of death for? We're going to go to a place that we like. Good question, and we're going to get to that in a moment. But to recap what we're saying quickly, the real me is who? My soul, not just my body. Now, the real me, the soul, as we described before, is a part of God. God is eternal. Hence, we are eternal. We exist before coming into the body, and most certainly we exist even after the body is no longer here. And finally, the real eternal me is not affected by birth or death. Life in this world in the body is just part of the journey. But, now we get to Gershon's point. Okay? On the other hand, on the other hand, okay, page 8. Does that mean we shouldn't fear death because we're going to go to a better place anyways? 
where our soul is happier, where it's at home, where it prefers to be, where, ah, oh, thank God I'm back at home, back in Mauritius, back in paradise. You know? Think about other religions. In our, according to our religion, is it about get your 72 virgins and get back up there as quickly as you can, stab somebody so you could quickly, you know, the, the security guards can shoot you? Next week we're going to read the Akeda, which is very different than Al Qaeda, right? Big difference between the two. Judaism, we know, is a religion that cherishes life from our perspective. Let me just ask you a question. If a person is starving to death, is he allowed to eat ham, even if he's a vegetarian and kosher and strictly kosher? Yes, you better save your life. There are 613 commandments in the Torah, 613 channels with which we connect with God. Yet, our Torah tells us you're allowed to violate, you're allowed to transgress 610 out of the 613 commandments to save your life. You're allowed to drive on Shabbos. Oh, the rabbi just said you're allowed to drive on Shabbos. Don't take it out of context, okay? I'm talking about if it's to save a life. Even your own life. Okay, you're allowed to eat pork, if it's to save a life, you're allowed to do anything to save your life except for three things. What are those three things? What are they? Murder. You can't murder someone else to save your life unless it is self-defense. Self-defense is allowed. We're not talking about self-defense. You can't take someone else's life just because you want to save your own life. Okay, that's where you have a lot of questions when it comes to transplants and things like that. Because we're not going to get into that now. It's just the idea, the concept, that if I'm going to do a heart transplant, uh, I, let's say I need a new heart. This heart is not so nice. You have to get another heart. You've got to get a nice, good heart. Can I find a nice, good, kind-hearted person and say, I want his heart? But if I take his heart, that's death. That is murder. So you might say, oh no, he's very sick or he's very old. From the Jewish perspective, you can't take someone else's heart. Only God could. And that's why the concepts, the ethics of, heart, of any transplant in Jewish law are very complicated. We're not going to discuss it in this course. But when, let's say, the person's dead, clinically dead, then one's allowed to harvest the heart and transplant it. And the same would apply to other vital organs that if you took them out of a living person, the person would die. It would terminate their life. On the other hand, just a little interesting concept, there are certain parts of our body or organs that one is allowed and encouraged, according to Jewish law, to donate to help save another person's life. God created us in a unique way with two kidneys, but we could function with one. And therefore, if I'm able to help save someone else's life by donating my kidney, I must. And the same thing would apply to bone marrow, which is much easier than a kidney transplant because bone marrow regenerates itself. Most certainly so a blood transfusion because blood is actually for your benefit, for your own health, to donate blood to others. And... We could go through all the other things in a separate discussion about what's encouraged, what you must give. The easy ones are blood and bone marrow, and then there's more complicated ones like skin grafting and kidneys, and then very complicated like heart, lungs, and other vital organs. But the point being here is Judaism is a religion that values life, that cherishes life, that cares for life. It's all about life in Judaism, and therefore because we value life more than anything, you're allowed to violate Shabbos. You're allowed to violate Yom Kippur. We're a culture of life. So from a Jewish perspective, what's more important? Life or death? Life. So maybe you understand why there's a fear. Why there is thanatophobia. Why we have a fear of death. Because Judaism cares about life. Except you might tell me now, and if you read text 6, you'll see how we say, if you save even one life, you save the whole entire world, right? Is that the Jewish perspective? Is that not what the Talmud teaches us? So if that's the case, what did we say all before? Which you started asking a question about, Gershom. What we said about how do we reconcile the value Judaism places on the bodily concerns, on bodily life, with its belief on the immortality of the soul? Which one is it? Is the soul happier in this world, or is the soul happier in that world? In heaven or on earth? Which one's better for the soul? Where does the soul prefer to be? Not where I prefer to be. I prefer to be in Mauritius, but right now I'm here. How do you know heaven's not here? How do you know heaven's not here? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> the soul knows that it's only here that it can do the actions that enable it to 
level. Yeah. Okay. So certainly, without going into too much detail of that now, I will try to dedicate time to that in one of the future lessons. To put it in short, it is only in this world that we're able to accomplish certain things. Only a soul and a body is able to give charity. Only a soul and a body is able to put on to fill in and to light Shabbos candles and to keep kosher and to make a blessing on food and to do all the physical things we do in this world. You can't do them in the, in the, in the heavenly realm. God put us in a physical world because there are certain physical things we need to accomplish. And that was part of the whole intention of creating the human being according to Jewish teachings and tradition. Not to remain in the, in the heavenly realm. Yes, the heavenly realm is spiritual and holy and divine and all that. But this is the world of action. It's here in this world where we get to accomplish things. Where we're able to achieve and do that which we need to accomplish. The whole purpose of our existence, of the whole purpose of creation. And in fact, text 7 comes from the Talmud. The Talmud says something fascinating. That God made a stipulation of creation with the universe. The whole entire purpose for the world's existence, as we read here in the Talmud in text 7, comes from Talmud Shabbos 88a. The Gemara says, God made a condition of the world. If the Jewish people will accept the Torah, will fulfill my commandments, will do that which I put them here for, then that's what you were created. That's why we need the world. But if they won't do it, then I, the whole world will cease to exist. That means our accepting the Torah at Mount Sinai 3,327 years ago was the purpose of existence. Had we not done so, the world would cease to, cease to exist according to the Islamic statement. Just imagine. Young couple commit each other to marriage. They start planning for the wedding. Big preparations. You have to order the flowers and the gowns and the whole retinue and the food and the catering and the hall and what else? The bar. And then she says, eh, I don't, I'm not interested in you. There used to be a commercial on Chai FM. I love this commercial. You know, uh, what was her name? Give me a nice name of a good Jewish kugel. Huh? Okay, Esti, fine. Esti's breaking up her engagement with Chaim. And her father says, what happened? Oh, I don't like him anymore. So, but I see you're still wearing that nice, big, fat diamond ring he gave you. I didn't say I don't like the ring. <laughs> so just imagine. Does, is there any need for the caterer, for the bartender, for the limousine driver, for all those things if there's no wedding? Who needs it? It's just clutter. Who needs the all, all the food and all that stuff if you're not having a wedding? And so the Talmud is telling us the whole purpose of this world's existence was for us to be in this world and to fulfill all those commandments of the Torah. That is our purpose of existence. Again, as Jewish people, I would say every person in this world has their unique purpose and mission. And each person is good as they are. As Jewish people, we know the Torah gives us our mandate for existence. And every person in the world, I believe, is created for a purpose and for a reason. It doesn't make one better than another. My interpretation of chosen, by the way, Jewish people never run around the world saying we're the chosen people. I think it's something others always imposed upon us, the chosen nation. But my interpretation of the chosen nation, what were we chosen for? I don't think it was for Hitler and Stalin and all that. Uh, we're chosen to fulfill these commandments of the Torah, to do that which we were chosen to do. So the mitzvahs, by us doing those things, doing good deeds and making the world a better place, they actualize our relationship with God and life, according to this, in this world, is so much more important than the afterlife. Because in the afterlife, you cannot do all those things. It's only here in this world that we can accomplish and do all those things. And so on page 9, we come to another text. This is a story in the Talmud. The great sage Rabbi Judah the Prince, Rabbi Yehuda Anasi, he was about to pass on. He's lying in his deathbed. And his student, a student, Rabbi Chia, turns to him and says, Why are you crying? The rabbi was crying. He says, Isn't it a bad sign for a person to pass away crying? Isn't it a better sign if you'd be passing on to the next world? Happy, joyous. And you know what he answers? Something very peculiar. Look at the last line. He says, I weep because of the Torah and the commandments that I will no longer be able to study and observe. Was he afraid of death? Why is he crying? Is he scared of death? It doesn't say he's scared of death. 
You know what he's concerned about? When I go to that next world, I will have no more chance to connect with my children, with my family, with my friends in the way that I can in this world. I can no longer observe the Torah as I can in this world. I can no longer do the mitzvahs as I can in this world. Can't do it in the next world. So what we see here is, unlike what we were building up before, that the world, this world is only the antechamber to the next world, which is the great banquet hall, we seem to be indicating that this world itself has tremendous significance, that life is paramount, that this world itself is very important. So is it a contradiction? Which one's more important, this world or the next? Read text 9. Text 9, the Mishnah tells us, Al karchach It is not by your choice that you were created, that you were formed. It's against your will that you were born. Remember what we said before. Talmud says, the soul didn't want to come into this world. The soul is happier in the other world. And it's against your will that you live. And it's against your will that you die. It's not our choice. Those things are not our choice. Life and death, according to the Mishnah, is not our choice at all. In fact, continuing text 10 and 11, what we see here is the same exact concept. We'll just do text 10 quickly. Is the idea that the God dispatches the soul into this world. The soul doesn't want to go. Text 11 is a continuation of the Mishnah we read before again from Frank Yavah. It's Mishnah 17 before we did 16. Let's read this one together. A single moment of repentance and good deeds in this world is far greater than all of the world to come. Continue. And a single moment of bliss in the world to come is greater than all of this world. What did that mission I just say? Which one's better, this world or the next world? This mission seems to be schizophrenic. What is it saying? Doing good deeds in this world is more important than the entire world to come. The entire world to come is more blissful than this world. It's not a contradiction. When you're on holiday, you're not making money. And when you're making money, you're not on holiday. Ah, if you're able to find a combination of the two, that would be Lekka. Right? That would be paradise. But it seems to be that we're saying this is the world of action, this is the world you get to achieve, and the world to come that's the blissful world. That's where, you know, that's where you really get to live it up, so to say. So just to recap the ideas we mentioned here. The purpose of creation, God desires human beings to live holy and ethical lives. Where? In the heavenly realm or in the physical world? In the physical world. Very good. But the purpose of paradise, we're saying it's a means of providing us with reward for all the important work we do in this world. And so the world to come is the reward for all of our accomplishments and achievements in this world. Now, with that being the case, let us quickly go back to thanatophobia. Let's re-examine our fear of death. Because the mission has just told us one hour in the next world is more pleasurable than all of this world, but at the same time, one hour in this world is more important than the whole of the next world. So which one is it? Which one's more important? So, ah, we're going to get to that. Speaking of fear of death, I'm reminded of the story of the previous Lubavitch <coughs> Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzhak And in 1927, he was arrested by the communist regime in Russia. To them, religious observance and practice was considered the opium of the masses. They forbade it, they outlawed it, and the previous Rebbe created an underground network of Jews who were willing to put their life on the line in order to keep Jewish life alive in the former Soviet Union. My grandparents were part of that underground network, and they worked in very interesting and unique ways. Perhaps some other time I could tell you some of the stories. He was arrested by the communist authorities. Some of them were even Jewish. And they were interrogating him one day. And they put a gun, a revolver, to his temple. And they said, Rabbi, this toy has made Many people talk. This toy could get you to talk. Tell us who's involved in this network. Who's helping you out? Where are these mikvahs? Where's the kosher food? Where are these yeshivas and shuls that we forbade? 
You know what the previous Rebbe's response to them was? He said, that toy, that gun, could intimidate someone who believes only in, in this world. But I believe only in one God and more than just this world. You can't intimidate me. So was the previous Rebbe afraid of death? Was he scared of death? Huh? We appreciate life. We cherish every moment of life. But at the same time, he was making it clear that he realizes if his life were to end in this world, he knows there's another world that we go on to. We're not limited by just this world. And so, as we continue reading here, we've got only eight minutes left to go, so I'm going to try to wrap up and make it quick. As you can see in text 11, coming from the words of King Solomon, a very wise man, he says there's a time and a place for everything. And part of it, he says, is a time to be born and a time to die. Well, brilliant, King Solomon, genius. Then we all know there's a time to be born and a time to die. So, if you read text 12b, there's a fascinating medrash on this teaching of King Solomon and Ecclesiastes. And the Medrash says, King Solomon was not just telling us something that we all knew the obvious, that there's a time to be born and a time to die, but rather he says, from the moment of birth, it's already destined that there's going to be a certain time when we're going to die, when our soul is going to be taken. Okay, and he says here in text 13, just to clarify it a little more, we must believe that no created being can benefit or harm us without the permission of the Creator. That means, as difficult as it is for us to grasp, no Holocaust could have ever happened had God not allowed it to happen. Allowing doesn't mean making it happen. God gives free choice to human beings. Human beings can behave in crazy ways. It's free choice. God put us in a world of free choice. But if God did not want it to happen, it wouldn't have happened. A story I just read on the internet the other day, whether it's true or not, I don't know, but it's making its circles on the social media. A lady in Jerusalem was walking last Shabbos, five days ago. She's being chased by an Arab with a knife. She runs as fast as she can. He's pursuing her, and finally she sees the police station. She runs in, she tells them, they go out, they find the perpetrator, they catch him, they find him on Surveillance cameras, they see exactly who he is, they arrest him. In their interrogation, they're investigating what this was, and they ask them, you're stronger, you're bigger, you were able to chase her, and you could have stabbed her. Why didn't you? And he said, I wanted to, but there were two bullies around her, and they just didn't let me. They go back to the video footage. There's no, she's walking herself. He's chasing her. They ask her, were there two bullies standing at your sides? She says, no. But the whole time he was chasing me, I was praying. And I was quoting a verse that says, the angel of Michael on my right side protecting me, the angel Gabriel on my left side protecting me. I haven't verified the story. I haven't met the lady. Whether it's true or not is irrelevant to me. Okay? The concept, the idea is, if God doesn't want me to be stabbed, I won't be stabbed. We know there's intervention. We know that, for example, we pray with a sign of token. You can read, you can see it in Appendix C. We read it every Rosh Hashanah, right? We just read it a few weeks ago right here. We read there. In fact, why don't we turn for a second to page 20 and read that prayer for a moment. Just go to page 20, right? The Rosh Hashanah Somebody read the translation. What does it say here? On Rosh Hashanah were inscribed that on the day of Yom Kippur it is sealed. How many shall pass away? How many shall be born? Who shall live? Who shall die? Who shall live out is a lot of time. And who shall depart before their time? Read these lines. There's so much depth to it. Our allotted time. God gives us each a certain amount of time to accomplish our mission, to fulfill our purpose in this world. Is it possible for me to not even fulfill my mission? To not fulfill my time in this world according to this prayer? Who's going to die before their time? Who should perish by water, who by fire, who by sword, who by wild beast? 
who by hunger, who by thirst, who by earthquake, who by pestilence, who by strangulation, who by stone. Continue reading the prayer. Nothing can happen, as we read here in text 13, if God does not allow it to happen. That doesn't contradict free choice. We all have free choice. But if God decides it's not my time, it's not my time. I can tell you many stories illustrating that, but I will resist right now that temptation. And so, that being the case, we can conclude that just as there's a time, an appointed season for everything King Solomon tells us, it's already destined how many years a person is going to live. And so, our sages teach us, death cannot be prematurely imposed by illness or accident. As difficult as that is for us to comprehend, God will not allow a person to die if it wasn't their time. If they didn't fulfill their mission, their purpose, their function, why they're in this world. According to Jewish teachings, we will be here until that time that God decides. Now, is it possible for a person not to fulfill their mission? Yeah. We're going to discuss reincarnation in another lesson. If we haven't fulfilled our mission, then we come back to complete that mission. But that will be a separate discussion, and we don't have too much time left for that. So, Let's use, we have a few texts so, remaining. Let's conclude with this. Here is page 13, text 14. It says, the righteous people are considered alive even after their demise. So just imagine, a person passed away. And what does it say in the Talmud? Still alive. And I'm sure you're familiar with many such expressions throughout Jewish literature. David, Melech Yisrael, Chai, Chai, V'Kayam. What does that mean? King David, the king of Israel, is alive and existing. Let me just share with you something. About nine months ago, I was in Israel, and I was at the graveside of King David. Oh, he's alive and well. You know what else the Gemara says? Yaakov of Lomex. Jacob, our patriarch, is not dead. Don't, didn't we read in Genesis, the end of Genesis about his funeral? Huh? Don't you recall reading that? See what the Gemara says? As his children are alive, so is he alive, his legacy is alive. And you may have seen this with many other people as well. Certainly in Jewish literature we see it about great individuals. We read about Abraham and Sarah in this week's Torah portion. They lived 3,800 3, and something years ago. We haven't forgotten that. It says the Gemara, after the person is dead, they're still alive. And some people, even while they're alive, they're still dead. Without going into too much detail, that's text 15. How do you understand that? And I'll tell it to you very simply. I don't think we're just talking about a legacy, okay? I don't think we're just talking about a legacy. Because Hitler, Yamach Shema, also has a legacy, okay? He's not forgotten yet. As much as we say Yamach Shema, his name should be erased. I think it's much deeper. Some people live their life in this world in a spiritual way, and therefore that spirit continues to live on. And some people are just soil. Soil is about, it's all about me, myself, and I. It's all about the transient, about something quick. That's not going to last. That's not eternal. Eight years ago, a very wealthy man from Canada who built up Canary Wharf in London and many other big businesses around the world by the name of Reichman, I forget his first name, Edward maybe, passed away eight years ago. And when he passed away, he left two wills for his children. The first will... He said, I want you to open before my funeral. And the second will you're to open at the end of the Shiva. They opened the first will, and he had a re very interesting request. He wanted to be buried in a certain pair of socks he bought special for his burial. He wants to be buried in this pair of socks, very special socks. He was a very wealthy man a major philanthropist, gave to many charitable causes, and when he passed away, his children asked the Chaver Kadisha to make one exception and to allow him to be buried in those socks. But according to Jewish tradition and law, everybody's buried equally. We're all buried in tachrichim, shrouds, white shrouds. They're supposed to be cheap that the poor and the rich get buried equally, but I remember I paid like $300 for... Yeah. So, whatever the case is, here the Chaver Kadisha make it equal. Okay. The point is, everybody's buried in the same way. And they were, the Chaver refused to make that exception for him. And his children were upset at the Chaver Kadisha. How could you not? I mean, this man gave you so much charity over all the years. You can't make one exception for him? No. They didn't bury him in that pair of socks. And the children were very angry. You can imagine they decided, 
they're not even going to give whatever donation he left for them. But they said, that's Jewish law. We can't change it. At the end of the Shiva, they opened the second will. You know what it said? By now, you realize that I wasn't buried with my socks, nor was I buried with my stocks. Okay? When, we're, when we go, we don't take with us our physical, tangible things. We don't get to take the cash with us. We get to take the receipts. We get to take the receipts, the good deeds we accomplished in this world. This is a world of achievement. It's a world of action. It's a world where we accomplish things, but oh, the I spirit... Want to ask you yes, something. go Sorry. ahead. If you just go back to the previous yeah. one, where it says death cannot be prematurely imposed by illness or accident, on page 20, yeah. where it says... Yeah, where it could be imposed by... Yeah, here it does say. So what it's saying is, essentially, the way I understand this is, it, meaning, if not God allowing it to happen, it, unless, meaning, no one could die unless God allowed it. Okay? So, to me, my, my mother passed away young. Okay? She was just turned 60. It's young. And, obviously, it's a tremendous loss to myself and my family. And not even to speak of other people that we know, God forbid, young children have passed on. Right? It's so sad. And I cannot answer for God. I'm not God's attorney. I'm not God's advocate. But one thing for certain, the mission is telling us is, God allowed it to happen. There must have been some unique reason or purpose. A friend of mine recently lost his daughter. Young man, young daughter. He was here, he came, he was here at the shul, he's a rabbi from, she's somewhere in the States, I already just forgot where he is, not Utah, South Dakota or something, I forget which state. And he was visiting us, Mike, you probably might remember he came here to visit, he lost his daughter. Very scary, he wrote, his, he wrote a story on Facebook when it happened. Maybe this was his way of overcoming it. He wrote a story about the Baal Shem Tov, about a young couple, a couple that lost their child. And they came to the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov was a great holy master teacher. He had divine inspiration. He was able to, you know, something that I can't certainly have. And the Baal Shem Tov explained to them that their child was a reincarnation of another child, of someone else, who lived a very righteous, good life, but had two years that were imperfect. Whatever it was, two years in that person's life. And therefore, they merited that very special holy soul to come back into their life, the reincarnation of that soul to perfect, to eat kosher food, to perfect those two years of the person's life. I can never tell that to anyone. All I could do is sympathize and empathize with the person who's suffering. The Baal Shem Tov obviously had an insight that was beyond that. So the main gist of the teaching is only God could allow death. doesn't mean God causes it. God gives free choice to people. Okay? But the point is that we don't have to fear death because it's not an ending. But it's a beginning. We know the person is going on to the beginning of a new world. And that's why you don't have to worry that this beginning is, becoming, is going to come to a person before its predestined time. Because God won't allow a person to pass on before their time. Okay, we officially are over. I'm happy to continue with a few more points. I'm going to conclude with a video now. And I think the video will, give, will uh, highlight one of the main points of what we discussed today. So, just watch for a few moments and then... Eighth Day is a popular Hasidic rock band. One of their hits was inspired by a powerful episode in the life of the second leader of the Hasidic movement, Rabbi Dover of Nazareth. The student goes to visit a sage, and the sage has nothing in his house. He you says, know, where's your couches? Where's your chandelier? And uh, he says back to the student, where's all your stuff? You just have a suitcase. Still respond about who's passing through. And that's what the sage says, aha, just like you, I'm also just passing through. To his students' assertion, Rabbi Dover responded with a transformative insight. That's when he said, I am just like you. I'm just
where people spend uh, most of their life collecting stuff. And the city tells them, I'm actually just like you. I also collect stuff. It's just not that type of stuff. Not leather couches and chandeliers. I collect treasures of another kind. You know, he stays focused on that higher goal. Rabbi Dover taught his students that this world's glitter is a distraction that expires when the journey of corporeality chugs to an abrupt end. Better to invest in treasures of a kind that will benefit the soul in its eternal destination. If you recall, we brought this group out last year. We're going to be bringing them out for Miracle Drive, please God, this year. So you'll get to experience them firsthand. They're a wonderful group they're called Eighth Day. And as you can see, their songs have life for them. But just to sum up the message of today, some people think that life is what happens between birth and death. And the truth is, life is the part of the person that is never born and never dies. Our soul existed before our birth. It continues to exist even after a person passes on. And so... As we saw here in the video, as we pass through this world, we're just all passing through. The question is, what are we accumulating? Are we alive through this world? Are we living or are we just existing? Are we just doing things of mortality or are we accumulating immortality? Yes, you could be wealthy, you could have money, there's nothing wrong with having good things. That's very good. In fact, it will enhance your life in this world. But remember to focus on the real part. And so, indeed, this world is just the antechamber. It's the preparation for the next world. And when we truly live our life, we could live heaven on earth. So when we live and identify with the eternal values, then we ourselves become eternal. And that's why the Torah tells us, you'll see in the last text in your booklets, choose life. Next week, we're going to discuss how death informs life, the proper perspective. We're going to talk a little bit about how to maximize those moments that we have in this world before we get to the next world. From a Torah perspective, I think it should be a fascinating discussion. I'm happy to take any questions, and we'll quickly do a recap of all the lessons. That we Lesson learned. one. One. The awareness of our mortality and the resulting natural fear of death